Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Unicorn seminar series on the topic of superfluid optomechanics. And we have two excellent speakers for today's seminar, Dr. Christopher Baker and, Dr. and Professor Swati Singh. But before we start the seminar, let me quickly remind you the house rules. So please, if you have any questions, put them either in the Zoom chat or the YouTube chat. We will pass them to the speakers at the end of the talk. And so let's introduce our first speaker, Dr. Christopher Baker. Krish has received his PhD from University of Paris, where he worked in the field of cavity optomechanics. He is now a DECRA fellow at the University of Queensland, where he is currently working on the superfluid optomechanics and nanomechanical computing. So let's hear about your work, Chris. Uh, thanks, Swati. I'll share my screen now. Can everybody uh, see and, and hear me correctly? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So thanks for the opportunity to present uh, our work today. And so what I'll be talking about today is superfluid optomechanics. Um, and so, so this, uh, the main subject is cavity optomechanics. So cavity optomechanics deals with the interaction um, between photons confined in a cavity and a mechanical degree of freedom. And in the past few years, there's been a growing interest to use uh, superfluid uh, helium as this mechanical uh, degree of freedom for a number of reasons that are going to be apparent in the following. One of them being that its uh, absence of viscosity in the superfluid state uh, in principle enables it to make uh, ultra high Q mechanical resonators. And so <clears throat> um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, so a number of other works that uh, um, have been uh, done in the field. So. This is some very earlier work um, with some superconducting uh, niobium cell to de detect vibrational modes in, in liquid helium. Uh, here's some work uh, from Jack Harris's group at Yale, uh, where you are coupling density waves uh, in superfluid helium uh, with a, a fiber coupled cavity. Some work uh, using acoustic superfluid Helmholtz resonators. Some work here with, with quartz tuning forks to <clears throat> detect uh, quantized vortices and some, some other recent work where uh, helium is used as a prototype gravitational wave detector. And so th these are all superfluid optomechanics works and, and these are some fluid optomechanics works uh, for here an instance where you're using micro disks to probe the rheology of fluids. And, and here uh, some work by Tal Karman where uh, the, the approach is to leverage the compliant fluidic interface for optomechanics. And so what those superfluid optomechanics experiments I just showed uh, had in common is they, they all involved uh, the use of bulk helium. So, so uh, large, reasonably large quantities of helium and, and not thin films. And so our approach is uh, different in that regards in that it's using uh, nanometer thick films of superfluid helium. And I'll give a, a basic uh, example of, um, of our experimental approach here. So. Uh, we start off using some type of optical resonator, some type of optical cavity. What we have here is a silica microdisc, which serves as a whispering gallery mode resonator and serves to confine photons um, in its periphery here. And so this uh, resonator, which is on a chip, we put it in a dilution cryostat. <clears throat> And then when we cool it, we inject some helium into the chamber. And what happens is that this forms a nanometer thick self-assembling film that coats everything inside the chamber, including the resonator itself. And the reason it does that is that uh, there are these attractive van der Waals forces that make it preferential for the helium to, to wet the, the, the substrate uh, rather than pool. And this allows you to, to controllably uh, self-assemble uh, some, some thin film uh, on the resonator. And so now uh, what's going to happen is that uh, there's some types of excitations that can exist in those films. These, these are uh, former surface waves and they're, they're mathematically uh, analogous to shallow water waves, uh, you, which you'd have uh, instance in a lake. The difference being that the restoring force is not gravity, but the van der Waals interaction, so the attractive force towards the substrate. 
And so what happens then is if you have these waves that, that oscillate on the surface, uh, here I have a cut view of like the, the uh, field distribution in a whispering gallery mode. And uh, as the, the fluid uh, oscillates back and forth, you are left with more or less um, kind of dielectric in, in the evanescent field of the optical mode. So the, the mode senses the presence and the motion of the superfluid helium on the surface. And what <clears throat> this does is this creates a dispersive shift. So the position of the cavity is going to oscillate in time at the mechanical frequency, which is shown here. So if you got a, a laser at a fixed frequency for instance, uh, represented by this dashed black line, uh, put on the side of one of these uh, optical resonances, the optical transmission as a function of time, which is this solid black line is going to be modulated um, at a frequency which corresponds to the mechanical frequency. Okay, so this is the basic uh, optomechanical setup and you can use these, uh, you can use this to detect the, the, the motion with high precision and also use the optomechanical tricks, such as uh, laser cooling and laser heating as those excitations. The nice thing about using uh, superfluid films is that they're self-assembling. And what this means is that whatever kind of optical resonator you might wanna put in your, your sample <clears throat> chamber, uh, being microtoid, microdisc, photonic crystal, or sound microsphere, I'll, I'll tell more about this today. Uh, they're they can be uh, conformally coded with the thin uh, film. So there's a wide latitude in the types of geometries you can use. Um, okay, so why would you want to do thin film superfluid optomechanics? I'll point a, a few examples and then I'll, I'll address them in the following. So this here is like a, a form of optical waveguide. Um, so you got light that's confined inside here. And here I've represented uh, the, the superfluid film on the surface and its, and its wave, which are called third sound, is a velocity C3. And uh, the light exerts a force uh, on the film, uh, which tends to deform it. And this force uh, is an optical force, which is a form of a radiation pressure force and uh, a fountain pressure force, which I'm going to uh, tell, tell you more about later. And what's um, kind of unique here is that if you consider uh, optomechanics using a kind of conventional solid state waveguide or resonator, uh, you you want to use the light, so like the electrostrictive interaction or the radiation pressure interaction to deform that physical object. And that, that's obviously uh, quite rigid. In contrast, here, what you're trying to do is just put de deformations in a, a much more compliant superfluid film. So to give a, an idea here, let's say you got a silica uh, disk or, or waveguide, the Young's modulus of that is in the order of hundreds of gigapascal. Uh, in contrast, the effective restoring force uh, which which plays the role of the Young's modulus in, in this case is the, the van der Waals pressure and that's on in the order of kilopascal so you can consider the the relative stiffness of like poking your finger through uh, the, the interface of the water here compared to actually physically crushing the glass itself and so here we see we have about uh, kind of on the uh, about eight orders or seven orders of magnitude more compliance. So that means that each photon is going to have a much, much larger impact in terms of the deformation you can, you can achieve. Uh, what's also unique about uh, superfluid helium is that it has these excitations uh, called quantized vortices. I'll just uh, say that, uh, just a word about that just very briefly. Uh, if you consider one of these uh, resonances on the surface of the resonator, you have some acoustic mode those can be described uh, in the basis of clockwise and counterclockwise rotating modes like this. Now imagine you have a quantized vortex here that's, uh, let's say like a, a clockwise uh, oscillating vortex. This is going to mean that the clockwise sound wave, which is going in the same direction as the background flow is going to be frequency upshifted. Uh, the other one is going to be frequency downshifted. So now the two modes, instead of being frequency degenerate, you're going to see in your spectrum, you're going to see two modes, which is kind of shown here. And <clears throat> this is the, uh, uh, an indication of the presence of vortices in the sample. And now if you track multiple modes simultaneously, um, you're able to discriminate uh, both the number and the spatial location of the vortices, kind of as shown here. So it's, it can be a tool to image uh, vortex dynamics. So, so th these results are already a couple of years old. So I'm not gonna say more about that, but you can go see uh, these are the references below. 
Uh, another thing you can do is you can use this, this extreme compliance to do uh, a Briwa um, interactions. So uh, in a nutshell, if you look at the uh, Briwa interaction in the solid, you're using regions of high light intensity are going to strain the material through a combination of electrostrictive and, and radiation pressure forces. Here, it's the same kind of idea with uh, this is creating a periodically modulated refractive index. Now, the difference being that you're using uh, your fight resisting the resistance is, is only provided by this very compliant fluidic interface. Uh, so doing this, we we're able to show that you could um, get a, a form of a superfluid Brillouin laser with the lowest threshold uh, reported for a Brillouin laser in the micro range. Uh, so here's an animation of what it looks like, obviously exaggerated, but you have these regions of high light intensity that uh, essentially pool the superfluid and you can uh, <clears throat> use this to, to excite a traveling acoustic waves. And uh, in this case, the, the interaction with uh, between the light and the fluid was uh, in part radiation pressure, but there was also, uh, that was not sufficient to account for the, the, the forces and there was a, a reasonably strong fountain pressure component uh, interaction that, that was responsible for this deformation. Uh, but that was not very well understood or optimized for in this, in this geometry. So what we tried to set out to find is like, is uh, how can we essentially maximize and, and, and <clears throat> leverage this fountain pressure interaction? So before I say more about that, I'll just give a bit of background. So what is the superfluid fountain pressure? Uh, so this was discovered initially fortuitously. People were trying to look at uh, flow through narrow uh, channels. And uh, this here is called a super leak. So you have a, a small, <clears throat> a, a dense powder, which allows uh, super flow, but not normal fluid flow. And people uh, <clears throat> had these transparent cryostats back then using a flashlight. If, they flashed light on this section that resulted in absorption, which created heat. The superfluid flows towards the heat source. There can be no fluid uh, counterfluid counterflow because of this uh, super leak. And so just the pressure accumulates, creating a, a, a fountain. You can also create this uh, using a heating coil. And here's a video of what it looks like. So th this is a, a a superfluid fountain that's generated by this effect. And uh, essentially, the, the, this, this can be quite a large pressure. You can see this is several centimeters, uh, the, the fountain. And the pressure is given by this formula here, uh, rho s delta t. Uh, so where uh, rho is the superfluid density, s is its entropy, and delta t is the temperature difference. And so in order to kind of, you know, understand this and, and, uh, and be able to, to, to use this, we need to first understand how the heat flows in the system. Because what you want to do is maximize that, that uh, equation, which I showed. And so essentially, the, the fluid has very little absorption. So, most, so essentially, all the absorption occurs in the substrate. So here you have a cut view where you see the substrate of the optical resonator waveguide. And here's the superfluid on the surface. And so when there's an absorption event, the heat can either go down through the thermal bath, or it can go through this interfacial pizza resistance, which arises because of the difference in speed of sound between the media. And then the heat can be um, dissipated through evaporation. And now this is, uh, in order to optimize this, it's a, a fairly uh, complex problem because uh, there's some counterbalancing demands, like the entropy tends to go up with temperature, whereas the thermal conductivity and the specific heat of the materials goes up with temperature, which tends to reduce delta T. So to understand this, what we, the approach we use is to if essentially get this um, effective thermal model of the system, uh, which is shown here. Uh, where we have the heat capacity of the substrate, the thermal resistance to the, and, and this, there's this analogy between uh, electrical current uh, where voltage is, voltage is temperature and, and current is heat flow. Now doing this, uh, we want to um, essentially to, to get that force to do anything useful. There are two criteria which you want to verify. You want the rate, you want the founding pressure force to be as large as possible and you want it uh, to operate in a regime where uh, omega tau uh, is close to one. So omega is the, the resonance frequency and tau is the thermal response time. And so what you want is you want 
this force to be time delayed in order to be able to get dynamical back action and it needs to be optimally time delayed the same way when you're pushing somebody on a swing you want the force to be out of phase with the velocity the, the, the pushing and to be out of phase with the velocity so by using microspheres uh, and controlling both the stem length here which determines the strength of the anchoring and the film thickness we got an independent degree of control on both mechanical frequency uh, the entropy uh, and uh, the, the time delay. So the types of modes we're going to look at are, are these uh, so-called stem modes, where the, the fluid is essentially oscillating back and forth along uh, the stem. This uh, wide, abrupt widening here forms a form of uh, Helmholtz resonator. And <clears throat> the, this mode is well coupled to the light, which is confined here in the circumference. So the Sprengeri mode is located here. So what we do is we then we take all these uh, parameters for the system, the thermal conductivity, heat capacity, latent heat, vapor pressure, and so on. And doing this, we can uh, essentially create a map here of this, uh, uh, this figure of merit. So it's shown here in the color code is this ratio of the fountain pressure to the radiation pressure force uh, <clears throat> times a unitless parameter, which describes how well uh, matched uh, uh, in time the force is. So what you can see is that in certain regimes of parameter space, you can be up to eight orders of magnitude stronger. So what's interesting here is if you go uh, this way towards higher temperature, you see that this effect goes down abruptly. And the reason for that is that the superfluid film is essentially uh, coupled <clears throat> to the substrate via this Kapitza conductance, which still scales with T to the cube, and it's uh, coupled thermally to the environment through the vapor phase. And that uh, uh, grows exponentially, the conductance such that if you get hot enough, essentially the film is thermally decoupled from the resonator upon which it's lying. And you can suppress uh, this fountain pressure interaction. So here, this is like cut. So it shows uh, with the, the microsphere, it can kind of, depending on temperature, uh, achieve these very large enhancements in, in the fountain pressure. And here uh, in, our, in our previous device, which is shown here, you can kind of switch between the, uh, the unitary radiation pressure interaction in this regime or fountain pressure in this regime. And I see I'm, I don't have that much time, but here are the results. So what we do is we, we select uh, <clears throat> the appropriate resonator with the appropriate film thickness, and this allows us uh, to position ourselves quite near the, this optimum operating set point here. So when we do this, uh, we start putting light in the device and a measure of the strength of the interaction of the optimum mechanical interaction is the fact that the uh, the, the optomechanical interaction creates a damping, an optomechanical damping, the sign of which can be either um, positive, which leads to damping, or negative, which leads to amplification. And then you get the so-called phonon lasing, where you excite large amplitude coherent uh, mechanical oscillations once the uh, magnitude of that anti-damping is equal to the intrinsic damping of the mechanical resonator. This is what we show here. So yeah. Already with like uh, uh, 78 picowatts, it's a large number of harmonics, meaning you're just really uh, exciting very large amplitudes that uh, generate uh, nonlinearity in, in, in the transduction. And what we can then see is that the, the threshold power, so here this is the essentially the, the gain versus the detuning, and you expect uh, cooling on, on one side and heating on the other. And we, we see that the, the threshold is about three picowatts, at which point you already have large oscillation amplitudes and about 60% uh, modulation of your optical output. So to put this in perspective with other um, kind of phonon la lasing devices, so all these are optically driven. And this is the threshold power here in the, along the y-axis. So you see that this, by uh, appropriately leveraging the fountain pressure force, you can um, achieve like a, a threshold for that. <clears throat> Rejection of oscillation is about five orders of magnitude lower than anything that's been done before. These two data points here uh, correspond to um, essentially uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, which are uh, here driven by electron, single electron tunneling. And this paper explained as uh, where the, the feedback mechanism uh, is said to be of electrothermal nature, so a bit similar to this. So it, so it underscores the fact that despite being non-unitary, these, these thermal forces, when they're properly applied, they can be an extremely uh, efficient um, way to drive the system. And so these are 
different also in the sense that um, the radiation pressure interaction is a, is a, is a force uh, which arises as a, a propensity of the system to evolve towards an energy minimum. And these types of forces are entropic forces. Uh, an example of an entropic force could be like the, the, the stretching of a rubber band or even a, an ideal gas uh, expanding, uh, pushing against the piston. And these arise uh, from the statistical likelihood of the system to evolve towards a state of maximum entropy. If you take an ideal gas that has three halves and kBT for, <clears throat> and once it expanded, it, if it's thermalized, it still has three halves and kVT. So the reason there was this push was not to minimize energy, but to increase entropy. Uh, which is kind of readily apparent in the in the phantom pressure equation, which involves the the term the entropy term here. And now I guess I'm do I have a minute or two to just say something on this? Yeah, yeah just, you can take two minutes. Yeah. Um, so just switching gears a, a bit more about what we're we're working on. Um, trying to develop is all these experiments I told you about, this is essentially the, the, the setup. So it's quite complex. Uh, the, the chip is, is positioned um, on some holder here and we need to inject light into the resonator using these tapered optical fibers. And so these are quite fragile and they need to be aligned uh, in situ at cryogenic temperatures. In order to do that, you need some motors uh, you need to <clears throat> also need optical access to see what you're doing. So there's a five sets of windows and you also need um, electrical feed throughs or superfluid tight to drive those motors. You need a, a heat and line and so on. So these are all the requirements for, for this work and it makes it quite cumbersome to do these experiments. So what would be nice is if we could get rid of most of these, essentially get rid of all of these except for the optical feed through. And so the solution we, we've come up with is to uh, use these kind of puck shaped devices here where you, you put, <clears throat> you got a photonic chip here, you couple light into it using a fiber, and then you can seal it with the appropriate volume of helium. And then it's essentially a plug and play device for superfluid optomechanics, which only requires uh, fiber access punches. So, so to making the photonic chip is something like this. So these are made of <clears throat> silicon on insulator. Uh, so you, um, Here's some um, slotted uh, waveguide resonator. Here's a photonic crystal that uh, confines light and in principle also acoustic uh, waves. And what you can see is that the waveguide is monolo monolithically integrated here. So there's no need to align it uh, at cryogenic temperatures. So the only uh, challenge then is to essentially get the light uh, through these grating couplers, which allow the light to come in and out of the waveguide. And so the way we do this, we use these angle polish fibers which are then glued uh, into position. Uh, the, this little uh, container is then sealed and uh, using a crimping tool, you can make a superfluid type hermetic seal, which allows you to encapsulate precisely the correct amount of helium for your application. And this is uh, one of those devices then uh, put in the cryostat. The issue we had was uh, mostly due to the fact that uh, this, the fiber, the chip, and the glue are all have very uh, different thermal expansion coefficients, which lead to stress, which lead to these devices failing quite often. Uh, and since the turnaround time for, the, for these experiments is on the order of a week, if you want to do a cool down and a warm up, that, that's quite annoying. So what we did is we just did large amounts of tests. So different substrate, different glues, and all this data is about the equivalent of about 700 uh, thermal cycles. And we identified, essentially for those who are interested, the most efficient uh, glue to do this so we can get very high uh, reliable um, ways to, to, to bond light. So this is one of these devices. It's uh, essentially, <clears throat> you can do superfluid optomechanics experiments in any kind of cryostat that reaches below one Kelvin uh, and it only requires uh, fiber access. And Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, I've talked about the uh, phantom pressure force in thin films and how it can be optimized um, uh, uh, and used as, as an advantage and also uh, switched on or off and uh, uh, work towards kind of integrating, fully integrating and packaging uh, these, these experiments. So yep, thank you for your attention.
Yeah, thanks a lot for the interesting talk. Do we have any questions? Okay, if not, then I can ask one. What What is the film thickness? Oh, so the film thickness is uh, you can choose, but it's it's anywhere between roughly a few mono layers to about uh, 20, 30 nanometers. And so okay. these experiments were done with like a 25 nanometer film. The earlier ones were with seven nanometer film. So it's that's the range. Okay, so does it affect your experiment? Because if the film is too thick, then you have three, 3D superfluid rather than 2D which when you consider, because they do have different mechanism, like 2D superfluids, they have mm -hmm. two different mechanism how you achieve the superconducting, superfluidity. That's right. So uh, for as far as third sound is considered, it's still, um, you're still in the, in the limit is that the, the excitation um, that the wavelength is much larger than the thickness so so the third sound is really um, that that limit of shallow water waves is, is valid whatever the thickness um, <clears throat> as far as vortices go they're kind of 2d in the sense that um, the 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 vortex core can't can't rotate too much but it, it's the, the film is not 2D in the sense that you can start getting thermally excited excitations in the Z direction. Um, okay. But for, for these experiments with third sound, it, it's pretty much the same physics, uh, whatever the, the thickness. Okay, thanks. And how about the resonator? How challenging it is to make a resonator like, like a disc? Or the challenge is not so much in making them as it is actually being able to efficiently couple to them at low temperatures. So since you're trying, you're, you're trying to use a long working distance microscope to align a, a submicron fiber uh, to a resonator, so you, you need a kind of a position accuracy of probably on the order of tens of nanometers, and you need to achieve that. You know, through a pretty poor imaging system. So that, that's really most of the challenge. Okay. That and, and this thing is fragile. So if it snags onto the chip, it breaks. And so making the chips themselves, once you've got the, uh, you, you make arrays of them on, and you can, that, that can be quite reproducible. Yeah, and you also, okay. You also mentioned that you have been using crimp tool to make a super leak tight free throughs, not any stye cast, any, anything. Why did you choose that? That's right. So the idea is if you want to, so, so if, you, if you're here, so this is sealed with, with die cast. Um, the idea is you want to be able to put just the right amount of helium in there to control the film thickness. Mm -hmm. And um, what you can do is you can fill this up while it's connected to a pressure gauge, measure the, the thickness you want, and then seal it off. And the, the way you can do that is, um, using a crimping tool, which is kind of what you have in the back of your refrigerator when, when, the, um, uh, when you, you okay. seal uh, that. And you want to reuse it, so that's why. What's that, sorry? You want to reuse it. I mean, you can open it and then seal it again. That's why you want to use it. That's right. And you need to use a special <clears throat> oxygen-free copper or some, uh, okay. to do that. OK, thanks. Thanks a lot for the interesting talk. So let's move to the next speaker, Dr. Uh, professor Swadi Singh. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Delaware. Her theoretical work spans a wide range of quantum systems from atomic gases, optomechanical oscillators to superfluid helium. And she is also the recipient of the NSF Career Award and ITAMP Postdoctoral Fellowship. So without a further ado, Swati, please start your presentation. Well, um, Sabha, thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you everybody for coming. 
Um, I just want to say, um, I, I have a quick question. Do I have to finish in 30 minutes or do I have a little bit more time? Uh, yeah, you can take five more minutes. Okay. Okay. So just let me know, uh, you know, give me like a two, three minute warning uh, to mm -hmm. stop. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thanks for coming to my talk. I'll be switching gears. I'm a theorist, so I get to talk about all kinds of um, stuff outside the lab. Um, I will be talking to you about using mechanical systems uh, to look for dark matter and dark energy. And in particular, what is the advantage of using a superfluid optomechanical system to look for these things? Uh, so my uh, background would, I would emphasize the background uh, for dark matter and dark energy as opposed to helium because Christopher did a good job uh, talking about helium. Um, so by dark sector, this is a word I, I sometimes use. I mean dark matter, which is about 23% of the energy budget of our universe and dark energy, which is about 72% of the energy budget of the universe. So over 95% of our universe, we don't know what it is made of. And uh, the idea here is to use optomechanical systems to set bounds on what these things could be. Uh, so how do we look for dark matter and dark energy? Well, there are two ways. One is how do we know about the existence of dark matter and dark energy? And that has been through looking out through astrophysics. So we can build better telescopes and look further back in time by knowing our cosmological history better and better. We can set bounds on what our future would be and also what these uh, things could be made of. And uh, the other approach has been to do uh, to look for very weak couplings between normal matter and dark matter or dark energy. And these involve multiple direct detection experiments here on Earth. So far, none of them have seen a positive signal, but we have managed to rule out a whole but a lot of the parameter space for how weak these couplings can be. And in this, there's a wide variety of tabletop precision measurement experiments, and that's where optomechanical experiments come in. So oh, I should just say, if there are some quick questions, I'm happy to uh, feel free to interrupt in the interest of you know everybody else. Maybe you're not the only person who's confused. Um, so so yeah, I this will be preaching to the choir. Uh, the optomechanical systems are very sensitive force acceleration of strain sensors, and that is what I want to leverage to look for dark matter and dark energy. Um, on top of it, um, the, you're controlling a lot of mass very well. And in all these experiments, you're not just looking for dark matter, you're looking for dark matter coupling to normal matter. So by being able to isolate and control a lot of normal matter, you can look for a bigger signal of dark matter uh, coupling to normal matter. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And that is one big advantage of using mechanical systems over atomic systems, for example. There's a slightly different uh, ways of uh, things you can look for by leveraging bigger mass. Um, so um, in particular, I'll talk about two different candidates for ultralight dark matter, scalar and vector ultralight dark matter. I'll talk a little bit about what the mechanical signal is, how to look for it, why use a superfluid device. And then I will talk very little about some recent work from my group about looking for screen scalar candidates for dark energy. All right, so let's start with dark matter. About 23% of our universe is made up of dark matter, as I mentioned earlier. It constitutes about 85% of the mass in, in most galaxies, and uh, it doesn't interact with light. Um, that's why it's called dark matter, but we only know about it through its gravitational interactions. And uh, the only, we have no idea how massive dark matter particle or objects can be. There's about 90 orders of magnitude uncertainty in what it could be. It could be the right sprinkle of stellar mass black holes that would give us the right rotational dynamics, or it could be a fine mist of something like 20 orders of magnitude lighter than the neutrino. And that also works in the right quantities, just a lot of them. So you could be, um, so, uh, and there are a wide variety of theoretically motivated candidates uh, because most of us are not from particle physics. 
a one EV per C square is about 10 minus 36 kilograms. So, and uh, I will be talking about using mechanical systems to look for things that are much less than uh, dark matter that is has mass much less than one EV. So very, very light to be seen gravitationally. In this particular case, you use a mechanical system as a resonant amplifier of a continuous signal. And I'll talk a little bit about why and how this is the case. You could also use me optomechanical systems as single phonon detectors to look for particle-like, like WIMP-like dark matter. Uh, you can look for, um, you can use them as a weak recoil detector to look for object-like, so gram scale dark matter, microgram scale dark matter, and you can use them as part of LIGO to look for black, uh, to constrain black holes as a form of dark matter. In fact, mechanical, optomechanical systems have already constrained uh, dark matter in like all these four types. Um, LIGO uh, black hole merger statistics was used to constrain primordial black holes as dark matter candidates. And this statistics was challenged. So this is an interesting back and forth that's going on in the community. Um, levitated microspheres were used to constrain uh, object-like and particle-like dark matter. I believe David Moore gave a talk about it earlier um, in the year or a while back. Um, so uh, you can, if not, you should ask him again. This is very interesting work. Um, and then uh, for wave-like dark matter, very, very light. They there have been primarily there are cavity based searches there are some optomechanical searches and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that this is what my group has been focusing on so for the rest of the talk um, I will only be uh, talking about ultralight dark matter and uh, there are many models for this fine mist of dark matter we can all be swimming in a particular one that comes up for scalar dark matter is something like a galactic scale Bose-Einstein condensate. Since we are talking about superfluids, I thought it would be something, you know, a visual thing to have on your mind. Like, you know, if you were swimming in a galactic scale BEC, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> so what happens if you are indeed swimming in a galactic scale BEC? So how is it something like that? If uh, dark matter per particle has mass less than one EV over C square, it must be bosonic because the Fermi velocity is higher than the galactic escape velocity. Uh, around Earth, uh, the concentration of dark matter energy the, in, in terms of energy is about 0.3 GeV per centimeter square. So that's a lot of particles if each particle is that light. In this regime, for bosons, they can start to behave like a coherent wave over the length scales of Earth, at least, uh, with the amplitude related to the local dark matter density, uh, which from astrophysics simulations of our galaxy and similar galaxy appears to be around 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube. Um, this sinusoidal wave, this cosine wave, let's say, has a frequency that is related to the mass of your particle. And we don't know the mass of uh, dark matter, as I mentioned earlier, to nine orders of magnitude. So you have a cosine that you don't know the frequency of. The wave number is associated with the, the relative velocity of dark matter compared to Earth or sun, um, which is about 500 kilometers per second. That is how fast the galaxy arm is moving compared to the center of the galaxy. And this cosine is, um, is coherent um, for a million oscillations, irrespective of the frequency. And after a million oscillation, the phase flips. And uh, so, so there are certain features of this signal, like it's always there. If the dark matter uh, density is that high, you're not being bombarded by dark matter particles. Instead, there is an, a signal that is always there. You just don't know at what frequency. It has a Q of 10 to the 6. It's locally coherent. And the signal oscillates, whatever it, it is, uh, whatever effect it is. And I'll talk about how it could be a strain. It could be an acceleration. Um, the frequency is uh, given by the mass, as I mentioned. And so if you're coming from optomechanics and trying to learn particle physics, uh, like I did, uh, 
then you start to ask like what exactly is 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube and uh, it's about 100 grams which is um, mass of a squirrel and that kind of explains what the problem is if um, if if all of dark matter in the volume of earth is concentrated in an object that let's say has the mass of a squirrel 100 gram object then it becomes a problem of like trying to measure a very rare event like you can you can use your weighing machine to find it but what are the chances that this dark matter you know object slash squirrel is on top of your weighing machine so you could have seen it gravitationally but you can on the other hand if the kind of dark matter that i'm talking about which is much much lighter than 10 orders of magnitude lighter than neutrino you will never be able to detect it using any weighing machine. You're going to look for non-gravitational couplings, but that signal is always there in your lab. So, so depending on the type of dark matter you're looking for, uh, one has to look for the detection paradigms are, are very different. And so I wanted to highlight that. Um, in terms of wave-like dark matter, there are a bunch of proposals to look for such signal, as I mentioned, um, mostly using cavity-based approaches. And uh, so and I should say that uh, the two I will discuss were led by my graduate student, Jack Manley, um, and they all involve a coherent, um, a resonant amplification of, of a coherent signal. So let me start with the first one, which is about scalar dark matter and how it gives you a strain field, which then gives you a displacement signal, which can be amplified using a mechanical device. So I'll quickly go over it. If um, a dark matter coherent field is linearly coupled to standard model fields and, and particles, then this kind of a linear coupling can be absorbed in modulation of fundamental constants. So the fine structure constant alpha is being modulated at that cosine I was talking about our electron mass is changing at uh, with, with this sinusoidal cosine. And uh, if these things are changing, then the Bohr radius of every atom is changing. And uh, so one can think that every atom is getting bigger or smaller at a frequency associated with the dark matter mass. If every atom is getting bigger or smaller, then a ruler made up of atoms is also getting bigger and smaller. So you can see that how this effect, this length change effect is amplified in a macroscopic solid. Furthermore, if your ruler has a breathing mode at the dark matter frequency, this signal, this uh, this you know this tidal force that is making your your ruler get get bigger or smaller, is even more amplified at uh, the acoustic resonance frequency, and that's kind of the the approach for resonant detection of dark matter. You have an isotropic strain signal that is amplified at your acoustic resonance frequency. So your mechanical system is, is a ruler of Weber bar. So all dark matter curves look like this, these parameter curves where every experiment is kind of like scooping out some of this curve. We don't know the x-axis, which is the mass of dark matter, which corresponds to certain frequencies. So the upper side of your x-axis is a bunch of frequency and, and uh, the lower side, I have the corresponding dark matter mass. Uh, it's just E equals mc squared kind of, uh, so h bar omega equals mc squared, that's the scaling. Um, and, uh, and the y-axis is DME, which is a dimensionless coupling to your electron mass, for example. So you don't know two things in your strain signal. You don't know the frequency and you don't know the amplitude because the amplitude is related to how strongly dark matter couples to normal matter. This uh, parameter space has been constrained by uh, equivalence principle violation experiments in Seattle. So that those are the blue things. They more recently, they have been constrained by a whole bunch of gravitational wave detectors and optical cavities. They are all looking for this kind of a length change effect. Uh, so those are all the, the red lines. I want you to focus on the origa line around 10 to the minus 11 EV per 
per centimeter cube. So that's around a kilohertz. Origa is a resonant mass uh, Weber bar like detector whose data was reanalyzed to constrain this type of dark matter. And, uh, and you notice that there's like a very skinny slice that uh, such a system takes out with at ar around the resonance frequency of um, this, this aluminum Montan bar. Um, so, so that's the idea behind resonant mass uh, detectors to look for dark matter, that you can probe very weak couplings between normal matter and dark matter, but for a very small range of frequencies. And so um, you, you can say that dark matter gives you this tidal force and, uh, and then do an analysis uh, of what the signal would be compared to all the noise in your system, typically thermal imprecision and measurement back action. And that's standard analysis. And then you kind of see set bounds on uh, how much of this coupling you can rule out. And uh, a while back, we wrote a paper on looking at breathing modes of a bunch of systems from bulk acoustic wave resonators to superfluid helium devices. And, uh, and, and how the first few um, mechanical modes of these systems can be used to kind of, you know, slice out this cake. I should say that all the white part is, uh, so all the, the grayed out part has been constrained by other experiments and all the, the white part has not been constrained, so has not been ruled out. And so you can see that a wide variety of systems can be used to kind of take thin slices out of this cake. That's how I like to look at it. I wanna highlight uh, superfluid uh, detector. So what's so special about um, a superfluid helium system? And uh, just wanna take a quick detour about what I mean by superfluid, helium, uh, superfluid system because they can be different. Christopher talked a lot about films. I'm not talking about films. I'm talking about like a big bucket of helium and the elastic deformations in your bucket or whatever you want to call it, a <laughs> cup, they are my, my mechanical modes. And, and so, you know, things are getting bigger or smaller. You have a lot of mass um, and uh, one kind of take some of these modes and looks for how um, these modes would be excited by dark matter. Um, and um, Christopher mentioned some of this work. This was inspired by early experiments in, in Kuit Schwab's group um, and where they showed that such acoustic modes of superfluid helium make a very nice low loss um, resonator, a very high Q. And it's a lot of mass. And we started to think about what is such uh, a mechanical device good for. And then, and, um, and then we, we wrote a paper on how it can be used to make a basically Weber bar, but like centimeter size. And uh, that can look for continuous gravitational waves, such as those from pulsars with sensitivities comparable to LIGO. And, uh, and this was a while back, but it stayed on my mind. And, and uh, I would say a John Davis's group um, kind of uh, followed up on, on this idea. And uh, they showed, and this is uh, that, um, by, they showed that by tuning the pressure of this device, you can change the resonance frequency without sacrificing the Q factor. So now you have a nice, resonant you know mass on spring system whose resonance frequency can be tuned significantly which is very important whether you're looking for pulsars and wanting to correct for doppler shifts or you're looking for dark matter where you just don't know the frequency of your signal which is what i was talking about so those thin slices can be converted you can like scan through them uh, this is very similar to admx which is a scanning probe microscope yeah. What am I talking about? Which is a heliscope, a scanning heliscope. This is looking for QCD axions. So that kind of technique, a scanning scheme can be used to kind of pro carve out like a big region of this parameter space using a superfluid device and tuning 
its resonance frequency. So we are working with uh, John's group on, on something like this. A few margaritas were involved in coming up with an acronym Helios, which if you squint, you can kind of see superfluid helium-based ultralight dark matter optomechanical sensor. I am not good with acronyms. So the students here are welcome to suggest better names. <laughs> and. Uh, and we are planning to look for um, dark matter around a kilohertz ish. I hope he talks about it next week. Um, so we are very excited about this work. Um, happy to answer any questions. This is very beginning stages. Um, Want to take a detour about uh, vector dark matter, um, which is about dark photons. So instead of a spin zero uh, field, uh, so a spin zero particle behaving like a coherent field, which will be scalar dark matter, you can have spin one particles behaving like a coherent field. So this is just like photons, but a little bit of mass. So the question becomes, how do you, and, and you can map it to, you know, so this is where my, I put on my theorist hat. Uh, how do you look for photons? if you were blind, like how would you know that you are just being bombarded by photons? How would you look for photons? So what kind of a device it would be? And this is kind of the, the intuition behind looking for these kind of effects. And, and if it was electromagnetism, you would say that this couples to charges, electric charges, you have a Coulomb force and you look for this kind of Coulomb force and, uh, and that would tell you that there is such a thing as, as photons. Um, and so that the idea behind like, if on top of all the, par the particles we know, there is one more spin one particle, massive photons or dark photons, and it couples to charges, not necessarily electric charges, let's say like dark charges, then there will be a force uh, related to the coupling strength, so something like epsilon, um, between this this coherent field, this dark um, field, and normal matter, your your charges depends on the number of charges and force per unit charge, which is about ten minus nine, uh, minus sixteen newtons. Um, if you are indeed swimming in these kind of dark photons that are coupling to dark charges, then a mass made of those charges is going to feel an acceleration but everybody's swimming in it. So everything would, would feel this acceleration. So like, how do you know? But if you have um, something that is coupled to masses that are made up of two different things, two different like types of materials with two different charges, then you're gonna have a differential acceleration signal that is proportional to the charge to mass ratio. And uh, so the difference between charge to mass ratio of these two materials. So by using these two, two materials that are coupled, let's say optically, you should be able, you will be able to measure differential acceleration. And again, this effect would be amplified on an acoustic resonance of uh, this like mass on spring system. So that's the general idea. Again, the same thing. We don't know the x-axis or the y-axis. Um, so the coupling is characterized, I should say that in this case, we assume the coupling is to, instead of electron charge, um, the baryon minus lepton number, which is cosmologically motivated. It, all this also works for baryon number coupling as well. Um, but let's assume baryon minus lepton number. So again, you have a sinusoidal force. We don't know the frequency of, and uh, there's a coupling parameter GB minus L, which is what is used. And uh, we showed that uh, silicon nitride membranes can be used to look for this coupling. Again, it's the same idea. You kind of carve out a little thin slice and, um, and uh, one can you know, look for higher order modes, build different array of different devices to do this. And similar techniques can be used. And so I've not done the, the theory, but one can see that given the tunability provided by superfluid helium systems, one can look for this type of effect with superfluid helium and the container that is in. Um, so it turns out that superfluid helium inside a stainless steel con container does not give you a differential acceleration signal because bare and minus lepton numbers are the same. Um, but uh, one can design the container to put this helium in 
to do a tunable search of uh, vector bosons. Um, candidates for dark matter. Dalziel Wilson's group is uh, following up on this uh, silicon nitride membrane-based uh, vector dark matter detection. Um, so I just want to kind of take a step back and say that um, these are two approaches. There's a few more in this uh, workshop and then white paper led by Dan Carney, Gordon, uh, David Moore, and Cindy Regal. And uh, these are not easy experiments. The strain is about 10 to the minus 20 per root hertz, which is LIGO-ish. Um, and uh, the acceleration sensitivities are also very small, but I can't read it because uh, pictures are in the middle. Uh, but uh, but um, the point is that there are a bunch of mechanical systems that have the experimental sensitivity to go after these effects to kind of set new bounds on this parameter space. So far, it has not been constrained, well, apart from Origa, um, by, by any mechanical system. So I look forward to new constraints over the next few um, months to years to come. Just want to say that this is part of a much broader effort to look for ultralight dark matter using a variety of quantum and classical sensors. So you can use clocks, atom interferometers, NMR-based techniques um, to really constrain dark matter, like small tabletop experiments, uh, you know, compared to one ton of xenon in a mine. Um, and so to look for dark ma matter across 20 orders of magnitude, and this is new effort, and we wrote um, a community white paper, and I encourage you to to read it um, if you are interested in like zooming out, getting a perspective on using all a variety of quantum sensors to look for such dark matter. Um, there is a bunch of new constraints. There is a bunch. It's an exciting time. Um, there's a bunch of new constraints by small scale experiments. There's a lot of proposals, including the ones that I talked about to look for dark matter. As you can see, this plot's getting busier and busier. And I'm happy to talk to any of you guys about some of this stuff. So with that, I want to take a brief break and uh, ask if there are any questions about the dark matter part. I don't see any questions in the chat, so we can proceed. OK. OK, so I'm going to go over this really fast. I apologize for yeah. the energy stuff. OK. So um, this is, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to read the paper. I'm going to go over this in five, 10 minutes. Um, apart from dark matter, there is about, you know, there is this thing, dark energy, which is a very different problem. About 72% of our universe is made up of it. And we have no idea, not even a beginning to look for something like this. And one of the most bizarre things about dark energy is that suppose you have a box of dark energy and the universe expands and now the box is like twice as big, then um, the amount of dark energy in it doubled. If it was just because the energy density is constant as the universe expands. So as the universe expands, more and more of its energy, I mean, energy budget becomes you know, dark energy. And when you have something like this, you start to think, oh, maybe, you know, it's like um, you have many, many more modes in a bigger volume. And, and I can just start to add up the zero point energy and, uh, and I'm going to get a number and you know, of, of every field that I know of. And that must be dark energy. And you do something like that and you get a number that is 120 orders of magnitude bigger than the observed um, energy density. So something, you know, very bizarre is happening. We have no idea what it is, but it'll be fun to like constrain these theories. Um, so one of the simplest uh, theories for dark energy is uh, called quintessence, which is um, let's add another scalar field. So spin zero field um, to, to the mix. And uh, it turns out if it has some interactions, this is a form of, um, this is something that would have negative pressure. So, so this can cause um, accelerated expansion of the universe. So galaxies are not just running away from each other at constant speed, but accelerating away from each other. And such a fluid permeating all of our universe can give you this effect. Um, and uh, it, it does not solve the cosmological constant problem because you can see that adding one 
more field on top of that 120 orders of magnitude difference is you know still pretty bad but uh, but uh, it uh, what it does solve is it gives you a knob um, to say to kind of explain why it's only now, now as in just the last 4 billion years that we have lived in a universe dominated by dark energy, whereas the early universe was not dominated by dark energy. So, so we, you know, it's not like the cosmological constant is this number magically always there, but instead like it can change and it just so happens to be this number today as in the last few billion years. Um, and so um, these kind of fields would also mediate forces between Earth and Moon or two masses in the lab. And people have looked very careful, uh, carefully for these effects. And we always find F equals big G M1, M2 over R square. So there is no fifth force. These um, theories have been very well constrained. Quintessence theories have been relatively well constrained using these fit four measurements. And um, so one way to kind of get around uh, lab constraints and the fact that we live in an accelerating universe and a scalar field kind of gives us a paradigm where some of this can be explained is to come up with, is to add one more term to the potential of this field, which, um, which is, uh, which involves coupling to local matter density. So between two galaxies, there isn't much matter. So it behaves like dark energy and it does its thing. But between two balls in your lab, it is uh, very screened because the rho, the local matter density times phi your field, that effects kind of takes over this linear effect. So you have a field that behaves differently depending on its environment. And this is why these fields are called uh, quintessence, um, these type of quintessence models are called chameleon uh, fields because it behaves very differently depending on your local matter density. And for some reason, only cosmologists know the coupling to normal matter is characterized by a parameter big M. So there are three unknowns in this theory. One is the power law of this power, inverse power law interaction, big M, how strongly it couples to normal matter and, uh, and uh, the self-interaction uh, parameter. So, so how much does this field talk to itself? And uh, one can derive um, the force due to this chameleon, chameleon field between two, let's say, spheres in your lab. So you can see this is a very nonlinear equation of motion. Um, one can uh, indeed derive this thing. And it was uh, also done by my student, Joey Betts, um, who comes into my group after a few years of doing QFT and cosmology and then going, what is all this good for? Uh, the parameter, so it looks very much like a correction to Newtonian gravity, and it is. And there are these screening parameters, lambda one and lambda two, I'll talk about it. Um, they depend on the density, size, and, and vacuum. Um, effects. And then I said, well, these uh, analytical expressions apply to spherically symmetric mechanical systems. And the two we came up with were levitated microspheres and, and torsion balance experiments. And one can indeed constrain uh, dark, uh, dark energy using these mechanical systems, using uh, experiments that have been like um, using experiments um, at sensitivities that have been demonstrated. So those kind of like doing data analysis of those experiments or revisiting them, we should be able to constrain a wide uh, range of parameter space between atom interferometry and your wash. One can probe weaker couplings using large masses or weaker self Swati, Can you please finish within two, three minutes? Yes, yes, I, that is my plan. Thank you. Uh, so, and uh, and uh, I just want to say that the coupling parameter depends on rho r square. A superfluid uh, test mass has very small rho, uh, and so one can use uh, superfluid to kind of probe much weaker uh, couplings that have been probed in the experiments before. And uh, so, with that, I just want to say, um, I just want to. Um, you know, and the talk, uh, 
I hope I convinced you that um, one can uh, look for, I'm sorry, um, one can set new bounds on uh, dark matter and dark energy using optomechanical systems. Superfluid based optomechanical systems have an interesting role to play. These are very difficult experiments. So at one kilohertz, you're looking for strains around 10 to the minus 20, accelerations around 10 to the minus 11 meter per second square, and similar numbers for dark energy. Um, but I would say uh, that they are worth pursuing. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge the people, my students who actually did these calculations, Jack, Russ, Joey, and Ryan. And uh, the work on dark matter was led by Jack Manley. The work on dark energy was led by Joey Betts. I've been working closely with a cosmologist, astrophysicist, Daniel Grin, and multiple experimental groups and, and theoretical groups. Happy to take your questions now. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the great talk. I think we do have a question in the chat. So will there be a good coupling between dark matter, for example, WIMP and a superconducting cavity? Um, yes, they, so this is like the QCD axion people, they are looking for it. I'm, I'm, um, they're looking for a dark, um, Okay, hold on. Let me revisit this question. Um, are you asking me about, so I should, uh, so whether it is QCD axion or dark uh, photon search, the short answer is, is yes for ultralight. For WIMP, it is unclear to me that if there will be a coupling between WIMP and a superconducting cavity. But for ultralight dark matter, whether it is axions, pseudoscalar bosons, or dark photons, the answer is yes. And there are some experiments and some constraints. I'm happy to tell you more about it. Okay, thanks. I think, I hope this will answer his question. So we have one more question in the chat. Do you use the same kind of optomechanical devices to detect both scalar and vector DM? If so, how do you distinguish between them? That is a very good question. You know, we've kind of like run in circles around this uh, because that was my my hope. We kind of, after writing the papers, you know, you kind of step back and you're like, oh my God, wouldn't it be great to do that? And uh, and then the, the experiment that John's um, student Marvin is, is building, it turns out that the B minus L coupling is zero. So, uh, but I think one could design an experiment. And this is where like, I have to work closely with experimentalists. Like how do you distinguish between a strain signal and uh, a differential acceleration signal between you know, your, your, your microwave system or, or basically your, your box and, and uh, this and, and does it cross talk with each other? So if you are, interest, I'm happy to, I will be working with experimental groups. I've, I've started those discussions. I hope the answer is yes. I'd like to be an optimist. Uh, so far, I haven't exactly worked it out, but I, I think my instinct is yes. Um, I have to think very carefully about how to distinguish the strain from the acceleration signal. Because at the end of the day, most people are detecting, you know, distances, right? So you're looking for displacement. So how do you know? Yeah. Thanks. So do we have any more questions? Uh, I think, yeah. Antonio, can you please unmute yourself and ask? Hello, hi, uh, fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so you had uh, uh, towards the end uh, an uh, exclusion poll out uh, for the chameleon fields. Yes. Uh, and then the way it was shown, it, it looked like, like most of uh, the parameter space uh, was uh, Excluded, yeah, yeah, that's the, the one I'm talking about with the yeah. um, uh, microspheres and the torsion balance. So, I was wondering, uh, well, is uh, uh, how much of the likely parameter has already been excluded? Okay, so anything in gray, eared wash, and atom interferometry that has been excluded. The paper, uh, so great, it's not here. Uh, so we put something on archive, here's the reference um, for it, um, that proposes using 
levitated microspheres and torsion balances, gold like millimeter, submillimeter scale torsion balances to look for dark, ma uh, dark energy in this regime. And uh, more importantly, the reason we should keep working on it is uh, this plot that shows uh, so if you kind of, as I mentioned, uh, the student of mine actually comes from cosmology. So he went on this cosmological detour. And we found that if you have a scalar theory that where you constrain it to have small quantum corrections and um, weak coupling to normal matter, so it doesn't disrupt Big Bang nucleosynthesis, you are constrained to these regions, which is like blue yellow mix. So greenish regions, and you can see that with these devices, and these are not optimized. We took things that have been demonstrated in the lab. So this is not optimized to exactly look for dark energy, and we can set new bounds on, on with, with that. Um, the idea is that this is just the beginning, and uh, we should keep working on it to constrain uh, chameleons in a region that they could be dark energy. So you can see that there's very weak coupling to dark matter. It is way outside the region that has been constrained by atom interferometry. It is well below the region that has been constrained. Uh, so, so it's like here. Um, and what you would need is, is big masses and uh, closer. And I think, um, so we wanted to start with some analytical theory because it's a very crazy nonlinear problem. And just to develop an intuition for how things scale, how things can be designed. But it's pretty clear that one needs to use reduced geometries. So instead of a sphere, like parallel plate like setup. So, so we, we are, we'll be working, we are working on, on some of these things. Um, and I think that the next gen, uh, actually different types of mechanical systems, so non-spherical where I can give you an nice analytical expressions um, can be used to constrain um, chameleons in a region where they are most likely dark energy um, due to phenomenological or astro constraints. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, there's one, one last question from the YouTube. Do you have any idea and strategy how to screen all other forces acting on a mechanical oscillator like electromagnetic forces and gravity? Uh, yeah, so this is actually corrections to gravity. Thank you. Um, and where was it? Yeah, um, so, okay. Uh, one would, um, and we, we, for all the setups we considered, um, this is about, uh, um, the chameleon is uh, is a sig is comparable to gravity, and Casimir is less than ten percent. It's significantly less than the chameleon force. So we did evaluate these things, and we kind of steered clear of these. You would be, I mean, you can't screen big GMM over R square, right? It's always there. Everything else needs to be screened away. Um, and there are ways to do that. Um, this is the in the cheap way where we wanted to write these expressions. We didn't take into account because a Faraday, you know, shield that you would put is made up of mass that's gonna, you know, change the chameleon field, yada, yada. So you're gonna have to do um, numerical. Um, any experiment will have to, um, get the chameleon field and the force between them numerically. But in order to inspire experiments, we wanted to take these approaches and make sure that our, uh, our approximations are valid. So there are ways to do this and um, people are looking at it, but the, the pretty expressions that I showed you are not valid <laughs> in that uh, region because you're gonna have to add more mass to shield these things. And uh, then you're no longer two spheres in the middle of a spherical vacuum chamber situation. So, but thank you for that question. Okay, thanks a lot for the nice talk and great discussion. So before we end the session, I would like to advertise the next blog, which is next Wednesday. So, and we have two excellent speakers there. John Davis and Xavier Rogers. So please do join there. And thanks a lot for today. Okay, bye.